Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share screens then. Uh, team, welcome to our, uh, our chapter six, which uh, isn't exactly correct because my uh, RMD file, uh, RMD file did not render properly. So it's showing chapter five, but that's inaccurate. It's actually six. Um, this particular section, we're going to finish up on the topic of mapping. Uh, when I finished two weeks ago, uh, we were discussing the uh, output or the separation of if you have a void within your map, like an area that was excluded from the polygon, um, you could add extra layers to uh, encompass that. Uh, if you had like an inner lake or, or uh, uh, they were talking about political zones and how that particular state boundary would wrap around itself. Um, I can go back and cover that brief topic if you'd like. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to jump into our raster mapping. And one of the, the highlights, I guess, of this final section here is Mr. Wickham, the author of the book, was calling on a particular a package within CRAN that doesn't exist anymore. And so what I was explaining to Priyanka was that, that I had to use a dev tools to download uh, the, uh, the existing source of that package so that I could continue on with this uh, particular presentation. All of that was resolved over this last week uh, in prep of, of this uh, section. So I'll just say, um, what if your source uh, of geospatial data doesn't come from an SF form or a special feature form, uh, say maybe a geo TIFF? Now, this is where raster images come into play as well. And the metadata is up supplying your polygon or supplying your um, regional points where you would combine or overlay uh, existing special features on top of an existing raster map. Or um, I ran into this briefly uh, within our county. Um, I was using the mapping feature to uh, uh, show our property lines uh, that they had marked for us, and then being able to draw out uh, exactly where they're at and then export a geo TIFF that I would be able to interact with. I never took our, our conversation that far. So uh, I'm just going to stick with what the uh, book is, is uh, referencing. All of this problem, uh, or this isn't a problem. There's a service called the Geospatial Data Abstraction Library or GDAL uh, that can handle the data ingestion for you. So all the metadata that is contained within a PNG bitmap uh, geo TIFF or any of that feature uh, it's going to be able to ingest and use those uh, extra uh, data contained within that just single raster image. Uh, there's a good chance you may not even require the use of these higher order functions uh, because the system will take care of it for you. Um, SF GDAL read, uh, special features GDAL read would automatically ingest your raster image for you if required. So what we're going to do is use a package called Boomerang. Uh, and this is now deprecated, it's no longer on the CRAN library. Um, if you would like, it is under the DevTools download. Um, you can install it from the open, uh, our open side boomerang uh, feature. What we're doing is accessing an FTP library uh, for the Bureau of Australia, uh, Meteor I'm gonna mess this word up, meteorology. Uh, it's the Bureau of Meteorology for the uh, country of Australia. And what this link does is allow us to access these raster images, their satellite images, and then be able to download uh, particular uh, points that would match a given date timestamp or a, or a wildcard type search. Okay. Now I'm not gonna run this particular code because it does uh, create a very long list of uh, uh, indices, uh, all of your various files. Um, but what we're doing is creating a, a variable called files, calling on the boomerang that says get available uh, imagery, uh, and then we're creating a string uh, package or string subset with that uh, wildcard search. Um, if you are to run this code, I would recommend, as it's stated, uh, use your current date and timestamp, but then back up like 24 hours or, or uh, 36 hours, whatever you're searching for. And the reason for that is because there is a, a, a delay in the satellite snapping the photos, downloading it, uh, and then the uh, Bureau of Meteorology making them available to the public. Okay. Then we're going to use a per, uh, per package, uh, per R, which is the, the loop um, that we're going to walk through. And we're looking at the raster files and then downloading their URLs. Um, again, I can jump over and show you this if you would like. 
uh, but there's two particular images that we're interested in, and it's the IDE00422 and IDE00421. And if you don't mind, or any uh, other person that is related to mapping, uh, would you mind expanding on what these different file types are? Or are they just timestamps of when the, the Earth is rotating and the satellite is snapping a photo? I don't know if it was unique that 422 and 421 were used in this script. I couldn't find a reference to that. I have no idea. I think okay. it looks like mostly timestamps. Correct. Go to the um, the the source to 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 learn what the file naming convention is. There's a there's a statement in here where uh, I believe it was eight images. It's either eight images or twelve images, and I, I don't know if it's it's where the satellites are positioned as they're taking the photos, uh, but they do make up a grouping of these IDEs, but they all have the same date timestamp. Um, Frederica, did you want to say something? I'm sorry. Uh, no, just uh, I had a look at this uh, this thing, um, okay. and uh, yes, it, this uh, two thousand um, and twenty one is the year, of course, and then maybe the book mentioned the two thousand twenty. Yes, and um, uh, this is the 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 ID numbers of the picture. I think the for for any days or any day of the year. Okay. Or something like that. Uh, so to identify which which picture is it, mm -hmm. I think. Well, yeah, no. uh, I I I am I had some difficulties in uh, using this the, the the code above. Yes. Uh, so I had to work it out uh, like downloading because if I use the the files, uh, I found the, the list of the available pictures. Right. But then uh, I, I had to take this um, address and uh, Google it. Yes. I had the same, uh, I had the ah, same issue. Okay. Yeah. So team, what Frederica is referring to, if you, if you just dump this URL directly into your browser, it's going to try and download from the FTP link directly. That's not how you want to associate with this. If you go to the Bureau of Meteorology for Australia, they do have a web page. It's a little bit difficult to find where this particular path is located, uh, but they do have instructions on how you can access it, how you can uh, download directly from this uh, uh, link. Like I said, this boomerang is no longer available on CRAN, so you can't just load it directly. Um, you would have to use the dev tools to access it. Um, I've noticed some deprecation a lot in the uh, R for, what's that? Uh, uh, our open sci. Uh, this particular company uh, produces quite a few packages, but then they get deprecated or they, the, the developer is no longer submitting to them. So then they're, they're uh, removed from the CRAN library. Um, they are still active. You can still call on them. You just need to go to the GitHub page and download it or, or build it yourself. So at any rate, to continue on, uh, what we're going to do is use our two <clears throat> particular images uh, one is going to create a variable called viz, and the other one is for uh, INF, INF. What was the INF supposed to be for? There's a, uh, is that inference? No. There's, we're calling on two different ID numbers, and that's what I wanted to make sure that, that the team re recognized is that within here, we're ingesting these uh, file paths, or at least pointing the R environment to the location of these two files. Um, these are TIFF files. And then we're going to use the stars package, which I've never used before, but it's just another geom type to be able to, to manipulate or, or ingest these type of raster formats. So by creating this uh, particular stars library, we're going to read stars, giving it the variables image viz and image uh, INF. We are creating a canvas, uh, so pixel size. Um, I don't want to get too far off the beaten path talking about the word canvas. It's giving a dimensional value to the size or scale. Um, if you want a larger image or if you want more data, not more data, but just a, a larger footprint on your screen, uh, you could change these as needed. Right now we're creating a 600 pixel by 600 pixel uh, block that is going to uh, uh, paint this particular image onto the screen for us. 
It says in the code above, the first argument specifies the path to the raster file and the raster IO argument is used to pass the list of low level parameters uh, to the GDAL itself. Again, going back to the top of this function, this is a uh, particular driver that is ingesting that metadata contained within that raster image. In this case, the nbuff x size and nbuff y size ensure that the R reads the data at a low resolution, um, and that's giving us our satellite visible object. Okay. So this is producing another uh, variable output, giving us our x and y coordinate systems, uh, and then the two and uh, sorry from and two offsets, similar to the special features uh, function. Again, you wouldn't be able to just access this metadata directly unless you're using some kind of a driver that would be able to interact with that metadata. To plot the satviz object using ggplot2, we will apply the geom stars object. So here we're calling ggplot2 uh, using the geom stars and then passing the satviz with a coordinate equals uh, uh, path. What is happening here and what it's going to explain is it's using the blue color and then uh, not uh, the aesthetic. It's going to give you almost the, the uh, contrast between the uh, sea level versus what's in the cloud cover. So you're getting different uh, elevation levels based on the, the different changes of colors. The geom stars function requires the data argument to be a stars object and the maps, uh, maps the raster data to fill the aesthetic. According to the blue shading in the satellite image above is determined by the ggplot scale, not the image itself. That's why I, I made a comment about the elevation, the depth, right? This is also the sat viz contains three bands. The plot above only displays the first one. Uh, if we wanted to continue with this, uh, we can add another layer to this, uh, which is now going to be in black and white form. So we're giving a scale of gradient for low being black and then high being white. So scrolling down, we've got three different image outputs. They are the same, excuse me, didn't mean to zoom in there. They are the, uh, all three the same file. What we're doing is just giving it a black and white image instead. What I found interesting about this particular satellite form of snapshot is you can see where the sun is rising and setting as the globe is rotating. Um, the three shots are, are identical to each other, so there's not any difference between the two. But if we had different timestamps and then be able to paint that, you would see the globe actually rotating uh, as those three images were, were captured. Uh, it says the limitation to displaying only the raw image is that it's not easy to work out where the relevant land masses are. Because this is a satellite image, all we see is the cloud cover over the top. So what we're going to do next is we're going to map the OZ features or OZ states. Uh, we used that uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were covering this uh, special features. We're going to modify and then add the coordinate systems of that special feature to draw the boundaries of Australia. Okay. So we're creating a variable again called OZ states uh, using the ST transforms function, uh, ingesting OZ states, and then CRS is the sat viz, ST CRS. Having done so, we can now draw the vector map over the top of the raster image to make the image more interpretable to the reader. So here what we did is create, again, the geom stars passing that satellite viz uh, file path, showing the legend as false. Geom SF is data OZ states, uh, and then fill NA color is white. Coordinate SF theme void and then scale fill gradient is black and white. Again, if you wanted to change those colors, you could. But the point being is that now, you're taking that raster image from a satellite using a, a geom raster format, and then also a special features, and then layering them on top of each other so you can see where your landmass is. Anybody have any comments in this regard? I have, I have a question. So is it true to say that, uh, that it, uh, it knows where to put this particular image of Australia based off of coordinates? So it, so there's coordinates associated to the satellite images. That's correct. Even though we don't necessarily, um, yes, we don't necessarily see that because it's a raster image, but the coordinates are part of the metadata. That's correct. That's what the GDAL uh, driver is doing, is accessing the metadata that's contained within that raster image. Okay. And then we're linking that to the special features 
SF coordinate system yeah. uh, with our OZ states. And what that does is now put the two on top of each other. So yes, that's how you're you're able to draw uh, one layer on top of another layer. Okay. And just so I'm clear on it, if for if somehow we were able to remove the metadata from the satellite images, we could still place the image into this canvas. I don't think so. No, because you would have no point of reference. There would be no way that that the system would know where these two uh geographic points are located okay that's a good statement no you're 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 thinking about it correctly what i'm referencing here is that the one data frame doesn't know the coordinate system of the other data frame okay so yeah. then is it what makes this a raster image is the fact that that we have information about each um each location so when i think of raster images i think about jpegs right mm -hmm. So uh, maybe if this is a, a similarity on a JPEG, each pixel has certain information about it, the color and the transparency or whatever. So yes, so, with that, sorry. So, to... so is that the, the same raster image that we're looking at the satellite viz is we have, we have, it looks like some kind of grayscale information for each pixel. Yeah. And that's uh, gathered from the satellite itself. Uh, I would I would say that it's a depth. You're adding another variable or another piece of metadata that gives us the depth of of focus or the uh, scale. It's uh, Kent. I apologize if you want yeah, to jump in. I think it's actually it. showing the extent of cloud cover. Okay. So the individual pixels um, are showing cloud cover, and the the question is right. This is a TIFF file, so it's similar to a JPEG. It has image values at each pick at each pixel location and then what makes it special the metadata locates the whole raster in geographic coordinates so it there's the metadata is associated with the whole image and locates it in in the real world and if that was removed you could still plot the raster probably with um geom raster and maybe get the same picture but there'd be no there's no coordinate reference. It's, it's not located in space. Yeah. So you would not be able to accurately plot the Australia map on top of it. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. So if this raster image is, we said 600 by 600, right? So 36,000, did I do that order of magnitude, right? 36,000 pixels? 360, six add four. Yeah, add four zeros on the end, right? Yeah. Okay. To three hundred sixty thousand. Three hundred sixty thousand. Uh, yeah. So um, sometimes the higher level math comes to me, but the arithmetic doesn't. So anyway, yeah. um, three hundred sixty thousand pixels in in this image, and does that mean that in the me metadata there's also three hundred sixty thousand items of metadata? No, because the pixels are all arranged on a regular grid um, because it's a it's a rectangular image or square image in this case. So the metadata, I, th I think, um, Ryan, if you go back to where you showed the stars object. Yes, sir. Uh, a little bit further up. Yeah, where you just showed. Yeah, there you go. Keep going. Okay. That, that top one on the top. There you go. So this is showing the dimensions, um, well, I don't know if this has as much information as I thought, but it's giving you a little idea. Um, I don't know what the offset and delta, but that's relative to some reference, I think. I can I can definitely go back to R and run this code if it would help, uh, yeah. Kent. Um, for me, it's okay. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I think that's all right. To, get the getting to yeah. kind of to the details of yeah. the GeoTIFF metadata, which I, I'm not too familiar with either. Yeah. But basically, it's taking this whole square raster, which could be you know a picture on my wall or just a you know some picture that doesn't have any geographic reference, but it adds the geographic reference and the coordinate reference system to oh. say, no, this is actually a picture of the globe from this angle. Wow. Okay. And all that 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 locates it in space. 
Got it. And, okay. and defines the projection, um, you know, that was used to, to turn it into something flat because yeah. some, some rasters might actually be, you know, a section of the surface of the earth. And then you get into the same issues with how do you project it onto a flat surface that you would with um, polygon data. Got it. Okay. Makes sense. Excellent question yeah. though. Very, yeah. very good question. Um, what I was going to finish up on is this last part uh, after we have our layering, the, the two um, lay, uh, geomes on top of each other. Uh, what the next example was going to add our cities. So the, the points on the map exactly where the cities are located. Uh, so we're creating another variable cities using the ST transform to ingest the cities very, uh, sorry, data frame that we had previously. Uh, and then what that does is now combine so that we're passing OZ states, uh, data is cities, and then the scale, uh, scale gradient is the same. This is a, a familiar line of text from previously. Uh, it was at the closure of our uh, section on, on uh, two weeks ago. We were using that geome special features, passing a cities variable, and then creating that red uh, capital points on the, the country of Australia, the various states within Australia. Then finally, the last point was adding one more layer of uh, special feature text. And so now we're accessing the cities and then passing an aesthetic for the label of the city. Um, because it was a black and white image and the, the uh, uh, points of the capitals were already in red, um, I chose the color yellow. This was a modification to the existing uh, block of text in your, in your book. What, uh, what I found funny about this is it happened on the previous example too. When we layered uh, on top of each other, uh, the text seems to skew across each other or it kind of just makes this jumbled mess. Um, what I'd like to do is work with this particular code block and fi figure out a way that I could expand those out so that maybe even you know point arrows at each of the at each of the capitals so that the text font uh, doesn't change size or color, just that it it expands out a little bit further. It's able to um, show it further away from the actual country, um, and you could be able to scale or read each of the uh, cities easier. Yeah, there's a package called GG Repel that might be able to do that. Um, it does exactly what you say for okay. regular plots. I don't know if it works correctly with spatial data or not. Okay. Well, I, I would think, well, you're right, Kent, that's a good comment because we are calling a geome special feature. Um, if that repel would work within that, uh, I would only think that it's just a textual layer. Um, you're looking at the city's data frame and then uh, putting another point or a, sorry, another layer on top of the, uh, the generated output. Um, I'll give that a shot. Let me see if that will uh, work for us. And By the way, it's, it's simple features, not special features. I'm sorry, I messed that up. Forgive me, simple features. I made that comment last week as well, or two weeks uh -huh. ago. I kept calling it the wrong term. Um, thank you for, for clarifying that. Simple features, simple features. The, uh, the last and final to this section team is just a grouping of hyperlinks that are going to provide you more information in relation to the topics of mapping in general. Um, I did go to a couple of these and expanded a little further into the reading about this topic uh, in preparation of, of uh, providing a presentation to you. Um, for the most part, I found most of these fairly easy to read once you comprehend um, how the coordinate system works together. Um, by extending into other arenas of this same topic, uh, Kent and I were conversing uh, on the subject earlier, uh, right at the beginning of our, our uh, conversation as everyone was joining us. But this would be other areas like the OSMR, um, that's the open street maps uh, ability of vectorizing or tiling. Uh, Ken, if you don't mind, I wanna just expand one more statement in relation to the word tile. So when you're, when you're looking at tiles, they are just that, think of it as a square. It's not technically square because the globe is, is uh, a sphere. So if you were to, to wrap that around the sphere, you're gonna get kind of some curvatures around it. 
when you are tiling, it's going to be a particular quadrant system. So your, your top left point and bottom right point is gonna give you a geospatial polygon. That is your tile. If you were to zoom into that tile, that's where you get different um, resolution points. Uh, and, and that was one of the, the uh, discoveries I had. This is again, two or three years ago when I was doing this, but um, working within that tiling system, your geospatial polygon points, all you're doing is just adding some precision to whatever it is view. Think of it as like zooming in and zooming out. You know, you're at 120 miles above the earth, you zoom into 60,000 feet and now you're staring at the bark of a tree. That coordinate system or that tiling system just gives you those, those polygons. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I'm done speaking on the topic of mapping. Uh, does anybody have any questions or um, I would like to provide some more information if possible or Kent uh, picking your brain uh, with uh, your experience on this subject for sure. There does seem to be a GMSF label repel and text repel. Oh, I okay. guess it's a package called GGSF label. Um, okay. So that might be the way. Gotcha. Found that by Googling for GG repel and GMSF and it takes you to awesome, somewhere sir. else. I have a question um, that I hope doesn't take too much time, but he came across the ST underscore as SF um, function, which takes um, some like maybe a more conventional data set and turns it into an SF object. Has anybody else seen the ST as SF uh, function? Sure. Yeah. And my question is, what is the, is there a, a, a format for the ST portion? So that, that more traditional data set, um, is there something, say if I was to create one by hand or manipulate an existing data set so that it was in the ST format so that it could then be used in the STSSF function? Um, I wasn't able to find anything that outlined how mm -hmm. to how to make an ST or how to uh, I don't format ST. think there is an ST format. The prefix, I don't actually don't know where it comes from originally, but a lot of these names are in common use across various libraries. Um, the inter especially the function names like ST intersect, for example, you'll find in the spatial add-on to Postgres, for example. Um, so ST as, as SF is the conversion into SF and it can take, I think, a data frame, for example, that has um, lat long. Yeah, so if you have a data frame, say a data frame that has lat and long columns, but, and you wanna plot it as a geographic object, as an SF object, you could use ST as SF and give it the chords parameter, which specifies the column names for the um, lat long. And then I think you probably has an optional, you know, an optional CRS argument. So you would pass in typically um, a coordinate reference system also. So if that data frame that you're talking about, if each record, each row of, the, of that data frame corresponded with a lat long coordinate, you might also have a different column that says what all of those coordinates relate to. Maybe it's a U.S. state or a, a neighborhood or your house or whatever, right? So, so you might have um, the state name, say Texas, and then a lat long for the first point that you're of that object. And then the next row would be <clears throat> Texas. And then the second point, Texas again, and then the third point and so on, right? So that's what I'm envisioning. Um, yeah, I haven't worked with that kind of data very much. Um, I'm, I was thinking more of like a data set where maybe it's cities in Texas. So each row is just a point with, and the coordinates just go to that point. Um, if you have polygon data in that format, yeah, I'm, I think you would need to group it probably and create individual polygons. I'm not, I'm yeah, not entirely sure how that would work. I'd That's what I was kind of wondering. So if you're using each of those lat long coordinates to create a polygon, vertices of a polygon, um, and this is kind of part of my question, is 
if each row is a, a vertex of the polygon you're creating, and then you convert it to S to an SF object, then you'll have one row for each grouping of vertices. Uh, that's how I understand SF objects. You can correct me if yes. my understanding is incorrect. Um, but then part of the question too is how do you make sure that all of those vertices are in the right order so you don't have like a zigzagging boundary? Yeah, um, I'm not sure. It's the grouping uh, thing that uh, lets you arrange the, the thing, the edges. Yeah, I, th I think you have to assume that they're in the right order in your original data frame. Um, and then there might be a better way, but one way to turn that into polygons would be to group it and then extract the polygon column as a vector and call um, st poly underscore polygon, I think, to create the polygon object. Well, my question is what, because there is a transformation if you have coordinates like latitude and longitude, and then you can transform it uh, or if you have geometry, for example, and then you want to, you may be able to extrapolate the, the geo uh, codes from the geometry and uh, to obtain the columns of the long, uh, latitude and longitude. Yes, I'm, I'm not sure I understand what your question is. <laughs> I say oh. the, the the function that does the transformation, the ST to simple features or the SP to SF. Mm -hmm. This transformation involves uh, taking, for example, the geometry, and the geometry is like um, it contains the um, the latitude and the longitude but mm -hmm. link it to a polygon yes so you use the geometry to uh, um, give a representation of the polygons yes but if you for example say that you don't have coordinates you need uh, the two columns uh, of latitude and longitude what is the correct way to extrapolate these coordinates from the geometry? If there's any, because it, it, I, I'm sure yeah. it is. So you want to look at the geometry and find out what the latitude, longitude right. numbers are? Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the nice things about simple features is it's just built out of really list columns and matrices. So you can, like if you open up a simple features object in the RStudio viewer, you can dig down into it, I think, and see the coordinates. Or you can, um, well, if you, so if you wanted to inspect a particular polygon, for example, you could, and it's in a geometry column, you could just ask for the, that particular entry in the geometry column and then convert it and then it will show you. Polygons can actually be fairly complex. They're, they can be nested um, th as three levels because you might have multiple outlines mm -hmm. and within those you can have holes and then all that gets can be grouped into a single object. Mm -hmm. So polygons can be complex, but usually they'll, often there'll be just one list of points mm -hmm. and you can see that data if you look at, if you just dig down into the data structure. They're not, they're not hidden at all. They're just nested a bit. But uh, at the end, if you group it, they're useful. Because if you group it, you can see, uh, I don't know if you group it for um, the, the subregions of a country, you can mm -hmm. see the, 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 uh, the, the polygons. <laughs> of the different regions, yes. That would be if the data set has that ability, correct? If there's a if there's a, a additional variable within the data set that allows you to group it. I understand where you're going. Like if, if I don't know, uh, Argentina, you wanna you wanna draw the, the uh, boundaries of that, um, you would just pull that out from the 
the simple features data set, correct? If that were an option. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, Frederica. Uh, I'm sorry that that was more than 10, 15 minutes worth of time. Do you want to uh, uh, take over for your next chapter's presentation? Sure, I introduce it at least and then okay. we'll see. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and we'll pass over. Can you see my uh, the chapter? Yes. Yes. yes? Okay. Okay. This the, this chapter is quite uh, it's interesting uh, as much as the map chapter. Very interesting. And uh, so, what the purpose of this chapter is to understand what network data is. Uh, know about uh, a few um, new functions and geoms that we haven't used yet um, until this chapter and then uh, uh, do some thoughts about uh, what uh, could the visualization of nodes and ages can be uh, thinking about as a them as a, an abstract uh, um, concept okay so um, this chapter is quite interesting, so I'll, I'll go uh, directly to the representation of the, so the practical part, so how to make it. And um, in particular, it, um, it's very practical as a chapter, so uh, it helps you to make a uh, um, practical example using uh, different packages. In particular, uh, it introduces uh, the GG graph for network visualization, and then uh, suggests that there are some other packages that can be used within and aside uh, to make networking of data. So what is a network data? Networks data consists of entities, which are nodes, uh, that means also vertex and uh, their relation like ages or links. Also ages are uh, can be directed or indirected. So you can imagine to to have uh, uh, like uh, uh, sorry about that. Okay, you can imagine that you have. Uh, um, uh, a network and all the, the, the lines will be uh, the ages and then the, the connections will be the nodes. So let's understand a bit more about uh, what means to, to have a tidy network manipulation. Uh, the, the chapter, the book, uh, introduce you to this tidy graph package, which is very nice, interesting to use. And uh, it is a deep layer API for network data. And it provides a new function aside the others that we are have already used. Uh, there is activate and this dot n. Uh, and the sub functions uh, dot e and dot g for the ages and the, the graph in itself, all the graph. So activate informs a uh, tidy graph object on which part the function works on the object or which part of the network you want to work on, other nodes <coughs> or ages. Um, this um, this is um, quite important because you in this way can activate the nodes or the edges and put some colors, for example, to highlight them to make more evident connection within your network. Then the, this dot n in particular gives uh, access to the node data uh, of the current graph even when working with the ages, and then you have this two that I already mentioned it. So you need to install the package, load the, the library, uh, and see that, for example, uh, mm, the book, the, the first example that he does, uh, 
uh, is this play Erodos, Erdos, uh, um, this is the reference, uh, Ren, yeah, I don't know how to pronounce it, but this is part of the Tidygraph um, uh, package. So you find it uh, inside the, the, the Tidygraph package. And it set up um, a sort of table with n, uh, 10, um, uh, n equals to 10, p equals to uh, 0.2. Then it, 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 uh, um, it's making a graph, basically. And uh, you can activate the nodes with the activate function and then add some other um, variables like class uh, with a sample of letters from one to four and the, the count uh, and there will be rep uh, there will be some replace replacement so they're not just one to four but they, they repeat themselves and then activate the ages then he does a range by this dot n function and class from you Mm, the output of this uh, uh, of this chunk of code is a table graph and this table graph is made of 10 nodes and uh, 18 edges uh, as you see here he made two variables from and to uh, apparently they, they're not uh, mentioned but uh, uh, as you see there is uh, uh, some work uh, done behind this function and uh, then finally the node data it's a class which some this with the, with this letter that's 10 10 uh, rows 10 observations uh, this is the first example and um, it's just to give you an idea, an idea of what is the output of, of a, a graph, how, how, how it is inside the function. Then you will use this when you make um, a visualization and this is the work behind it. So data uh, also, uh, when you use this, um, when you make a graph, can be also converted enough that you have like a list with um, x uh, an x of two columns and some hierarchy uh, between these two columns so you can your data can be converted as a table uh, graph and this function basically converts a data frame encoded as an age list as well as converting the result of H class. Basically, I don't know if you know about H class as a function. Uh, I'm asking um, in case if any of you have has any knowledge about H class. It does a no. form of hierarchical clustering. So exactly. It will turn it make a tree structure from your data showing groupings. Exactly. So basically, it works uh, uh, around the, this uh, on 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 this structure. Basically, uh, this um, here there is an example of the high school uh, dataset from the ggGraph package, and this is made like from to a year. Uh, there are three columns. Uh, which um, one is the, um, the year, and then these two are the connection. Um, so this is the basic, very basic structure uh, of a graph. To make a graph and using this, um, the, the function available, you need to have a list, something like this. Like this. So two columns with the interaction and one reference. Um, then you can use uh, as a table graph on this uh, data set 
and you see that what is um, the out what is the output is uh, as the same as before we have nodes it's a table graph of 70 nodes and um, 506 ages and um, it's an undirected multigraph with one component you have some names uh, as I um, ID colon and then the the age data is uh, with the information that you have provided so you have um, basically one more information and here he does uh, an example with H cluster uh, using this uh, other function from ggplot for the colors because H class class uh, calculates the takes um, consideration of the distance uh, of the information that you provide so in this case of colors uh, and then you can use as a table graph with this structure and you see that the output it's a tree it's a rooted tree uh, with eight left label and member members okay this is a bit like something abstract to see like this but this is what is it behind the visualization so maybe we can go back here uh, afterwards we have seen uh, a representation of this network um, basically what is taking all together all uh, and wrapping everything around it's an algorithm and uh, the the real be benefit of networks come from the different operations that can be performed on them using the uh, underlying structure so basically we have a graph with the structure there the output that you can see we can activate the nodes and then add some other information in this case we have uh, centrality page rank and also in addition to class there is the one more variable which is centrality and uh, as well as before from and to information so you you might mm, want to have more information about a structure what's happened behind your visualization you can uh, see uh, this link that leads you to tidy graph package uh, and here you have more you can find more information about algorithms and verbs that can be used I need to go back there okay um, let's see we have five minutes I just like to show you some visualizations okay uh, this is a, a network of data and uh, to visualize network data we use uh, ggGraph as well as we use ggplot2 um, for making a, a network data we use ggGraph and ggGraph uh, it builds on top of tidygraph and ggplot2 to allow a complete and familiar grammar of graphics for network data the syntax is exactly the same. You have a ggGraph and then a geom, uh, specified geom from ggGraph. So the, the engine inside this uh, syntax uh, basically will choose an appropriate layout based on the type of graph that you provide. And that means the type of data because uh, it's expected that the data that you put inside as an argument are data are graphs so data made settled ready to to make a graph 
And uh, here there's some other links uh, as before, and uh, still the um, more information that you can find. Um, basically, the base requirement, as I said, is a data frame that needs to be made with a list, an X and Y column, and with the same number of rows as there are nodes in the input graph. I don't know if it's clear, but it, it will be more clear when, clearer when we see an example. Uh, in this case, we, we load the library graph, which requires ggplot2, and we, made a, we make a, our graph. So this is the graph that we have used, so, the, the, which the output have, um, we have already seen. Uh, but now we can uh, visualize what are what those columns uh, that were like a bit mm, abstract to see like that uh, become more clear and to, to see their structure. Uh, we use the geom age link and geom node point because the age is uh, the, the the straight line that connect uh, that connects to to nodes and we use the points for give uh, to to make a representation of the nodes so this is the the syntax the basic syntax to make a graph uh, but mind that you need an object which is a graph because otherwise uh, uh, then you may want to uh, change things a little bit uh, as you see there is like a little uh, difference in the, in the structure with some layouts different layouts and uh, if we um, for example change here there is a little change in the graph uh, um, object that we will use inside the ggGraph. We activate the edges and we had an information which is uh, a uniform run uh, sorry random uniform. Um, with n, uh, which is the count um, of the number of rows, because, because uh, as I mentioned, need to be this, they need to have the same number of rows. Uh, this time we choose stress as a layout and uh, the weights, and as you can see, the geom age link can um, has been a bit uh, differentiated from the others with alpha using alpha for the uh, the um, the weights and then still the the nodes and then scaled as alpha identity which is quite interesting and you can see a bit of like uh, uh, dimensionality of the graph this way um, um one more example uh, i think we we can continue because we reach the top of the hour we can continue next week if you agree with that uh, yeah, we i think it looks it looks, it looks like a very interesting chapter i need to dive into yeah we can see even we can see examples so that would be very interesting but um, uh, to, to understand a bit more about the object that goes inside the ggGraph. That would be... So for, for the, the next week we will talk about uh, the rest of the, the chapter with cir circularity uh, and uh, how to draw node, nodes make different colors, make a better visualization, 
and see that there are other ways to represent like trees uh, information of information then um, a bit of explanations about all the geom that can be used uh, and the out uh, the output and why this geom age link is a geom age link what is actually does in a very simple structure so you can see what's happened and and then uh, like customizing it a bit uh, and so then we see some examples which are still <laughs> a bit in the discussion to see if we can work out some results as well uh, so this is the the chapter and uh, it's very interesting so even this this is a, another way to to make the age as a point you can even do that instead of just a link you can you can use geom age point so we're still gonna we're gonna go over this next week right yeah okay sounds good okay so thank you very much thank uh, you. we'll talk next week looking forward thank to it you. thank you thank you Frederica. thank you Ryan. bye have a good bye. day everyone bye. thanks everyone